Have you heard from George Brown? I wasn't expecting to. Don't be flippant. You've ruined everything. You've destroyed the country. We don't know that. We would have heard from him if the answer were yes. Well, we'll know soon enough, won't we? Why did you have to risk everything? It's not on my head, it's up to him. Yes, exactly. You've put our future in the hands of your personal enemy and dared him to thwart you. And now, he will destroy us. Or he won't. Enjoy your last five minutes as Premier. McDonald! Will, have you worked? Disaster. He's here. but we've taken everything else right to the frontier all the way to Sarnia how close are we? if we can peel off one or two of John A. MacDonald's cronies around Kingston we'll form the government gentlemen we've held Cornwall what about around Kingston? no, 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 no they've all gone conservative <sighs> what have you heard? damn MacDonald we needed those seats to win so we've lost? George? We've made impressive gains, at least. Hell with gains, Gordon. We ought to be the government. Because we let Lower Canada have half the seats, no matter how much larger we get, a handful of Tories can join up with the French and Upper Canada gets robbed again. Write it down, George. The paper has to go out. All right. Make room on the front for 300 words, 400 more on page two. What do you want for the title? Unpopular conservatives hang on? Don't be soft. Turncoat Tories sell out to French again. 
Oh, we've still got a hole below the fold. What do you want in it? Premier's railroad scandal nearly brings him down. It's not a full-blown scandal. It will be. Go work. The paper's got to get out. Mowat, heard you won. Congratulations. Thank you. Darling, is that you? I waited up for you. Did you win? Of course I won, Isa. Of course you did. Now you can take some time at home, can't you? Premier summoned the cabinet immediately. We had terrible results in the West. He nearly lost his seat. It's not right. Hugh never sees you. I don't have a choice. It's the Premier. We'll come too. We'll spend the session in Toronto with you. You can't. I won't take no from you, John. Isa, you can't. You're not well enough to travel. Perhaps in the fall. It's not right. A son should see his father. We'll arrange a visit, I promise. As soon as you're feeling better. Okay? I should sleep. Keep an Gentlemen, I am returned. John A., right here. Shave first? Indeed. And no trying to sneak leaving the sideburns. <clears throat> when I say clean shaven, I mean clean. You no, know, you're the only Englishman in the assembly without facial whiskers of <laughs> any sort. Only one in check trousers, too, I expect. Most assuredly. And here I am thinking I'm setting a style and no one follows. Oh, they'll follow you, John A. They just won't wear your trousers. <laughs> Come back when it's less crowded, dear. Now, the important question is, what are we going to do with my hair? Well, I'll tell you what I object to, Mr. Speaker. I object to the fact that the Premier asks this House for money to fund a railroad of which he himself is president. The man gives with his left hand and he pockets the money with his right. And how does Mr. Brown think railways get built if not funded by governments and, and managed by competent businessmen? Does he deny the public's interest in modernization? Or does he prefer a way stick to travel with canoe? The future of Canada is railroads. And this government will continue to build them. Hypocrites! Mr. Speaker, no man of conscience would act the way our Premier acts today. This bill is a travesty and must be voted down. This theft of the public purse must end. Has hypocrisy ever had such a naked face? The public will not stand for it. I will not stand for it. You will not stand for it. You, that's preposterous. I, you, I, Mr. Brown is one to talk of hypocrisy. He owns the Globe newspaper. No one in this chamber likes his pockets off of politics more than Mr. Brown does. I... Mr. Speaker, I'm debating the Premier. Throwing slander is not debate, Mr. Speaker, but that doesn't stop Mr. Brown. In fact, he throws slander at our Premier each and every day, doesn't he? And then, as sure as the sun will rise, that slander will be the front page of his paper in the morning. You're the slanderer, MacDonald. Am I? Premier's greed knows no bounds. What a shock. Now, I don't begrudge him. It's an easy racket. And it makes him a lot more money than we'll ever see. But surely it disqualifies him from calling others hypocrite for finding profit in their own endeavors. Indeed, if Mr. Brown is so keen to find the hypocrisy, I suggest he look to his own mirror. <laughs> Mr. Spence, Mr. Morrissey. Ah, Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, good day, sir. And to you, sir. As I was speaking today, I thought I perceived some 
sympathy for my complaints against the Premier, as I'm mistaken. If I can be blunt, there is an opportunity here for you gentlemen to preserve your standing in both the Assembly and your own ridings. An opportunity? He means to cross over. I know what he means. I'm asking what he's offering. I thought that was plain. Same positions under me as you have now under McNabb. Otherwise, when this government falls, and it will fall, McNabb keeps on with this railroad nonsense, I will have no other choice but to run reliable men against both of you. Count on it. Hard to press the final. So, when do you go over to Brown? How many are you taking with you? Who told you? You just did. You're not thinking this through. Yes, we have a problem with Sir Allen, but you must think of the consequences here. You'll put George Brown in power. We don't have a choice, John. McNabb's a stone around our neck. And Brown's not as bad as you say he is. Oh, there is nothing wrong with wanting representation by population. He's anti-French. He's a bigot. I'll, I'll grant you he's anti-Catholic. No, he's anti-French. He's both. Well, so are half my voters. The French are easier to deal with than Brown is. It's one thing to stir up anger and unrest to sell his newspapers, but he goes beyond that. George Brown is dangerous. Going around telling people he'll solve the problem of the French. <clears throat> solve the French? It's nonsense. And if it leads anywhere, it leads to violence. John... McNabb is poison to all of us. He's just dragging us down. If Morrison and I don't go over, someone else will. The reality is, we have the country, we have, and the French are part of it. We have to make it work. George Brown can't do that. And you both know it. Otherwise, you'd already have gone over. We can't stay under McNabb, John A. I'm sorry, we can't. It would be different if you were leader. Surely the thought has crossed your mind. John A., you know Mademoiselle Cuvillier? Mademoiselle, enchanté, comme toujours. Your family as well? My wife threatens to visit, otherwise they're fine. Mine too, constantly. She won't ever come. She just wants me to know she could. So, trouble? Spencer Morrison. We're going to cross to the Liberals. Sir Allen and his railroad. What do you propose? I fear we must convince him to step aside. I agree. But of course, I can be no part of it. No politician can be seen sticking the knife into his own leader and hope to replace him. My hands must be clean. Are you capable of it? Well, I wanted to discuss what happens after. What's there to discuss? I'll be premier. You're the obvious choice, yes. I am the only choice. No one else controls a fraction of the seats I do. Of course. But? Well, that would put a fully French face on a largely French membership. George Brown will wipe us out in Upper Canada. And in the face of Brown's bigotry, the French population will respond by uniting even more strongly behind me. Whatever gains the Liberals make in Upper Canada, Dorion's Rouge will pay the price in lower. It will balance out. It won't balance. It will deadlock. English versus French. It'll only get worse from there. But who else is there? Believe it or not, Spencer Morrison suggested me. You. I want a real partnership, George. The two of us governing together, not just carving out fiefdoms for ourselves like you do with McNabb. I want to get things done in this place. You'll still control Lower Canada, and I will commit fully to Montreal as the financial capital. And my client, the Grand Trunk, as our national railroad? Yes. With Montreal as its headquarters. And you'll have me, and together we could shape the assembly to our will. Perhaps we could. However, there's still the issue of our leader, my dear friend, Sir Allen. You want to lead? Burn it. No, 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 no! Let the trains go to Brown, then! I'll replace them! He's got half a dozen men with him. We won't get the chance to replace them. <laughs> they won't get me out of here without a fight. Yes, Alan, they will. And what happens when Brown gets in? Huh. Never! It won't last. It won't have to last to kill your railroad. Think 
can't. We've gone too far. It doesn't matter how far we've gone, Alan. He doesn't care about that. We've invested millions! He can and he would, and you know he would. No, he can't! Yes, he would! He can't! <laughs> What we do, we can't go back to the people so soon. No, you'd lose. You can't keep this office and be president of the Great Western Railroad anymore, Alan. The people won't accept it. Give it up or risk losing both. Is it your doing, John? No. Did you? No, it is most certainly not my doing, Alan. It's yours. I will go down with you if you so choose, but we will go down. And you'll lose everything you've worked so hard for. You've sacrificed enough for the country. Retire with the honor you deserve, knowing that your replacement remains fully committed to the success of your railroad. You already chosen a new leader? Who? I always knew you were ambitious. McNabb has resigned. Personal reasons. Of course, the government's going to try and survive. But... Mm, under Cartier? No. Under McDonald, but we still have Spence and Morrison. No, we don't. We don't have anything. They'll already be at the Governor General's getting sworn in. This is a disaster for us. Oh, why? George, we've driven the premier out of office. How can that be a bad thing? A snake instead of a pig is no improvement. We haven't driven McNabb out. We put McDonald in. In the two decades since responsible government has come to Canada, the Conservative Party has practiced and perfected the art of betrayal, yeah. of selling out their own good United Empire loyalist supporters to the quiet tyranny of the French. Yeah. And now they have a new leader before us. John A. MacDonald. And how shall we judge him? Serpent. We know one thing, that he will betray his superiors for his own personal gain. Mr. Speaker, I object. I ask the Tories, how can you trust him now? How can you follow a man that would put the knife in his own leader's back? Is there anyone he won't betray? Are your own children for sale next, MacDonald? My children? Who are you calling hard, Brown? My living son or my dead one? A bit rude keeping us waiting this long. He's telling us he's unhappy. About what exactly? Sorry to keep you waiting. Your Excellency, there's much to catch up on. So how was London, Your Excellency? In a word, torture. An unbroken series of personal embarrassments. Do you know why? Your Excellency? Because I am the Queen's representative for Canada, Mr. Premier, and Canada is an embarrassment. The country that doesn't, the colony that failed. I must take offense at that, Your Excellency. Well, how do you think I bloody well feel? Canada's my responsibility. Do you think I enjoy taking responsibility for failure? Your Excellency. Mr. Cartier, where is the capital of Canada? Toronto, temporarily. Mm hmm. And then it goes to Quebec City, also temporarily. The capital is an unfair issue to choose, Your Excellency. The hell it is! It's the absolutely indicative issue. Upper and Lower Canada were joined together almost 20 years ago, and you still don't have a capital. You burnt down the one in Montreal, you abandoned Kingston, and now you can't choose between Toronto and Quebec City. So every few years, you pack up the entire business of government and everybody's families and move them 500 miles away. This is how you run a country? It's not for want of trying, Your Excellency. We've held more than 100 votes trying to settle the issue. More than 150, actually. Well, there you are. How can you possibly get anything done when you waste 150 votes on an issue that's simply either or? It's past enough. It's time to put a stop to it. 
I say you put the capital here in Bytown. Uh, it's called Ottawa now, Your Excellency. Yes, yes, I know that. Whatever it's called, it's perfect. You see, it's right on the border. It's a magnificent location overlooking the river. You can even build a real parliament building. It is a novel approach. All due respect, Your Excellency, it's an illiterate lumber camp on the wrong side of the river. It's an insult to prefer Bytown to Quebec. No more than it is to Toronto. Look, I mean to solve this problem right now. We have important issues to deal with. The Hudson Bay leases are coming up. The Red River territories will be open for settlement soon. It is Canada's position that those territories will be given to us. But Canada can't even solve a simple domestic issue, like choosing a capital. Why in hell would it be given more territory to mismanage? Because otherwise the Americans will take it. Precisely my point. The Americans are growing, moving forward with their manifest destiny. Meanwhile, Canada is locked in the same petty arguments as 20 years ago, 40 years ago. This used to be a significant colony it could be again this is the first step sorry i cannot abandon quebec george george listen please there's a brilliance to this ottawa has no base there's no wealth there there's no votes no one gains from choosing it no one loses live with it you and me and George Brown alike. You really want us to build a capital city in the middle of the wilderness? It's Canada. Everything's in the middle of the wilderness. I don't understand. What do you see in this? The most fantastic thing in the world, George. The moment when the impossible becomes possible. George. This is possible. Even if I support it, Brown will oppose it. As you said, it's an insult to Toronto. And of course, it comes from us. You're right. He'll oppose it to the death, no doubt. But what if it didn't come from us? What if we were as shocked with the idea as he is? What if it came from her? Is that possible? I don't know. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that Her Majesty has responded to this government's humble request for guidance. I present to you our Queen's choice for the permanent capital of our young nation. Her Majesty Queen Victoria has selected Ottawa Town as a home of the new... No! Never! Toronto! Toronto! Toronto. Toronto. The issue is settled. The capital of Canada shall be placed in Ottawa town on the banks of the great river that joins Upper and Lower Canada together. That divides us more like MacDonald. Yes, Mr. Brown knows all about dividing, doesn't he? Thankfully, Her Majesty found a way to bring us together instead. Let everyone see for himself. We shall begin construction of a proper parliament in Ottawa immediately. Mr. Speaker, what is the purpose of this assembly if Mr. Macdonald can make such vital changes to this country without even consulting us? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, what is the purpose of an assembly when Mr. Brown only uses it to obstruct getting anything done? Thanks to Her Majesty, the issue of the capital is finally settled. Should we not be grateful? Nothing is settled until this assembly approves it. Do you dare oppose the choice of the Queen? Yea or nay, Mr. Brown? Mr. Speaker, I call on Mr. Brown to answer the question, is he urging this assembly to vote against the wishes of our Queen? Answer him. Of course, I mean no such thing, Mr. Speaker. The man hides behind the Queen's skirt is unconscionable. We can't fight it, George. It's the Queen's idea. Oh, you really think Her Majesty takes a keen interest in backwoods lumber towns, do you? The sun never sets on the British Empire, but somehow Queen Victoria found the time to take out a magnifying glass and pick out Ottawa. Ottawa? Don't be stupid! This is MacDonald's work. George, not everything is a result of some scheme by John A. It doesn't matter. 
The Queen has spoken. You can't even think of opposing it now, can't I? No, George, you can't. It's the Queen. If you came out publicly against her, it's unthinkable. I... Oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> Monsieur Dorian. <laughs> May I join you? Bien sûr. Est-ce que je peux vous offrir un verre? I'm afraid my French isn't what it should be. I would very much like to discuss something with you. Something somewhat delicate. S'il vous plaît, monsieur. That is a surprise. Well, why should it be? I'm leader of the English opposition, you're of the French, we are natural allies. Yes, we're not allies, are we? Perhaps because of your well-established antipathy for the French? My grievance is legitimate and restricted to the French influence in English Canada, which is out of all proportion. You can't deny it. And your solution is that we should submit to a complete domination by you instead. I'm not here to argue representation by population. Could we just put the issue aside? How can we, Mr. Brown? It's your central theme. Should I also cover my eyes and pretend I don't know who I'm talking to? Would you at least hear me out? Of course. I'm quite curious. I presume you oppose this ridiculous Ottawa proposal. I can assure you that all the French members wanted the capital in Quebec. But the Queen has chosen. So Karchi's followers must bite their tongues and vote for it, just as I must, or be called a traitor to the Queen. Yes, so this is the trap they've put you in. It's quite a good one. I, I can't get out of it. But you could oppose the Queen, symbolically, couldn't you? Daddy! You. You made it all right, I said. No. Mommy said it was a terrible trip. Of course she did. Let's go to the kitchen. John. Have you seen Hugh? Is he still up? He's right here. All right, then. Off to bed with you. Good night. Good night, Father. Good night, you. Why do you look so sad? I'm just tired. I'll bring Hugh to the assembly with me. Invaluable experience for him. <clears throat> you never used to look sad. Not ever. I'm not sad. If little John hadn't been taken. Isabella. It was so much better, wasn't it? Before. We were so happy. Yes, Issa, we were very happy. For a little while. For a little while we were. Mr. Speaker, Her Majesty Queen Victoria has chosen Ottawa as the capital for our united province. And on behalf of my supporters, I wish to assure the Assembly that uh, we will, of course, do our part to make sure the vote is unanimous when the bill comes before us. But it is imperative that history at least record the feelings of this Assembly. 
I therefore move for a symbolic vote to let each man say where they stand on this choice of Ottawa. Second. Let, let, let all understand this is not a, a motion of confidence or in any other... We have a problem. It is simply to What do you mean? I have to let my people vote freely on this. Where? What? You can't. I have to, John. I can make them accept that there was a fact, but I can't make them go on record saying they like the idea. You have to. Dorian will use it against them at home. George, you have to. Can't. Take the loss and move on. Mr. Speaker, it is unthinkable that this assembly should even consider a motion of defiance against the Queen. Mr. Speaker. There is no defiance in recording the personal preferences of those assembled here. In fact, it is a mark of deference that so many would be willing to set aside their own wishes and vote for the Queen's chosen site, as I myself have sworn to do. Mr. Speaker, I implore you, you cannot it's let this It's not a cost... confidence motion. There's no consequence if you lose. I have no cause to stop it, nor do you. The assembly will consider the motion. All those in favor of the choice of Ottawa as the capital of Canada. All opposed? The majority is opposed. Let the individual votes be recorded. Mr. Jeffrey. Cabinet meets immediately. Mr. Reams. All right. What do you suggest we do? We resign. Now. In defense of the honor of the Queen. What do you mean resign? We haven't been defeated. Would you prefer to wait until we are? Until Brown actually has the votes to put together a government himself? Because if we do not respond, it is only a matter of time until we fall. We are exposed as weaklings if we let this go by. Yes, all right, we must respond. But surely there's no need to give up the government. Yes, George, there is. If we step aside... The Governor General will ask Brown to form a government, and he won't be able to. He'll be exposed as the regional power he is. He'll be publicly embarrassed, and then we'll slip into the vacuum and resume power. And what if he doesn't take the bait? He will take the bait. I know the man, and that's why we must act now, before he really has the strength to hold power. It's a ridiculous gamble. I'll see us back in office in a matter of days. We have the votes. Mr. Speaker, Her Majesty's loyal government are resolved that we cannot let a vote repudiating the will and judgment of our sovereign monarch stand unanswered. Confidence motion or not, it skirts the edge of treason, and we will have no part in it. It is our intention to go directly to the Governor General and tender our resignations. What are they doing? They don't have to resign. They think we can't form a government. They want us to embarrass ourselves. Get us votes. No, it's a trap. Only if we fail. I told you he couldn't resist. Tell him. The Honorable Luther Holton, Chief Commissioner of Public Works. And of course, my colleague. The Honorable Monsieur Dorian, who will be leader in the Assembly for Lower Canada, also Commissioner of Crown Lands. Brown has sold his soul. That happened years ago. He's made a deal with Dorian and also reached out to the Irish in Montreal. He's put together a cabinet full of Catholics and gone to the Governor General. So much for his precious principles. Mm -hmm. He's finally done something intelligent, hasn't he? Didn't think he had it in him. No, you didn't. And you let your blind hatred push us right out of power. You didn't credit what he was capable of. Hmm? Do we still have the votes to top on? I don't know. Find out. Ah, what's we got today? Hey, John. How are you? Good, sir. Champagne, I'm buying. Uh, no, I can't stand the bubbles. No. I'll take a port. <laughs> of course you will. Champagne for me, a glass of the good stuff for my friend here. Oh, ho, ho. and what is it you're after then? I want you in government with me. 
<laughs> You're not the government anymore. You resigned. Well, I'll be back in soon enough. Come with me. No, I'm an independent. Independents are going the way of the dinosaurs. Thank you. You have to join a party to have any impact. And you know you want to have an impact, Cole. Don't deny it. And what is it you're offering? Come in and I'll give you the treasury. Free reign. Put that Midas touch of yours to use. What are my confederation ideas? <laughs> We're already pursuing Rupert's line in the Hudson Bay. That's not enough. I want to pursue dominion over the British North American territories, including the colonies. Yes, well, the problem is the other colonies likely have their own ideas, Galt. What idea is greater than a single continental British uh, North America from sea to sea, John? It's a grand idea, hey. and I'm all for it. I'll make it official policy and work to promote it. Not just promote it, pursue it. Of course, as it becomes possible. It is possible. You just have to act. We'd have to convince them, and I don't see how. Well, you'll have to find a way if you want me I'm and sorry, your government. I'm sorry, excuse me. We'll continue this. Sorry. Hey. Stop right there. I have no part in it, John. I'm loyal to you. And who isn't? All right, Galt. I'll make a policy and I'll move heaven and earth to do it, starting with Rupert's Land and the Hudson's Bay, all right? You have my word. Galt. What do we know he's already given away? No action on Red by Pop, and yes to public funding for Catholic schools in Upper Canada. He's clearly determined to make his government work. Well, whatever he's promised, you won't be able to pay. Mr. Speaker, I cannot help but notice that Mr. Brown's cabinet has more Catholic members than any government in our history. I wonder how he'll explain that to his constituents and his readers in the globe. What happened to the rights of the majority, Mr. Brown? Are they hidden away in the same place as your, uh, integrity? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, may I have the floor, please? Mr. Speaker, we would like to introduce our new government, duly sworn by His Excellency, the Governor General. And now, if it so pleases the Assembly, I'd like to ask for a Short adjournment for a few days while we prepare an agenda that we are fully confident will win the support of this assembly. Mr. Speaker, we need no adjournment to know that we lack confidence in this government. We move to vote immediately. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Second, Mr. Speaker, this is unacceptable. We must be allowed to present an agenda. Mr. Speaker, they had a chance and they asked for an adjournment instead. There is no agenda on the floor. There is only a motion of non-confidence in the government. I'm afraid he's right, Mr. Brown. Mr. Speaker, this is an assault on the assembly itself. We demand our customary rights as a sworn government. Here, here. Customs are not rights. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, the vote... It is moved that the government has lost the confidence of the assembly. We can win the confidence of the assembly! All voting aye. Well, I'm afraid you do not have it today. The government has been defeated. MacDonald has abused the very dignity of the parliamentary system itself. By toppling you so quickly, you mean? He denied us our right to present an agenda. We could have easily won enough votes to stand. Perhaps. No. The man is out of control. Reeling from one disaster to another, he makes a mockery of this assembly. How so? Well, this whole Ottawa idiocy for starters, hiding behind the Queen to force it down our throats. The Queen chose Ottawa herself, Mr. Brown. Well, we can be certain it wasn't her idea. She's not mentally deficient, unlike whoever advised her in this. I mean, by town, by town. In all seriousness, I can't even see how one could come up with such an astoundingly poor idea. And then he resigns over the whole issue in a fit of pique and throws the whole country into chaos. And when I do what is necessary to cobble a government together, he topples us without giving us a chance to present anything. Anything. And what remedy do you suggest? Unfortunately, the only option is to dissolve the assembly, call an election. It's too soon for another election. MacDonald's left us no other choice. Both he and myself have been defeated. No, no, Mr. Brown, you. You have been defeated. Mr. MacDonald has not. 
She resigned over insults to the honor of Her Majesty, and quite rightly so. There is therefore every reason to believe that he and Mr. Cartier retain the confidence of the assembly that you so clearly lack. Thus I find the only expedient thing to do is to offer them another chance. Mr. Speaker, has there ever in history been a government more steeped in trickery and treachery than this one? Only days ago they claimed to have resigned. Yet somehow here they are back from the dead without ever having to face an election in between. Surely the Governor General mistook his purpose when he allowed a snake like John A. MacDonald to charm his way around the law. I've done nothing with the law but use it, Mr. Brown, as lawyers are trained to do. You, however have sold your principles for power. And now you're left with neither. You've no one to blame but yourself. To his credit, Mr. Brown's government was remarkable in its brevity. (laughs) A failure of historic proportions. Don't change the subject, MacDonald. It is your perfidy we discuss here. Well, really, how could we discuss yours? You weren't in power long enough to do anything. Yours was a, a truly ephemeral administration. In fact... I already feel the memory fading. Was George Brown really premier? Or was it just a nightmare of disloyalty and treason? (laughs) A very brief nightmare. I'll grant you that. Americans are not to be taken lightly when they make threats of war. Just ask Mexico. Mr. Envoy. Yeah. We wish to express how much we appreciate your coming to the province of Canada first among the colonies. Yes, well, my visit is purely unofficial. Well, nonetheless, let us uh, take your coat. No, no, no. This won't take long. We have serious matters to discuss, surely. Do we? What actions are you planning? Britain has chosen a policy of strict neutrality, and we are, of course, bound to her will. Yes, well, um, Britain is 3,000 miles away, Mr. MacDonald, and you are on our northern border. You've got to take a stand, with us or against. We are colonies, sir. Our foreign policy is set in London, not here. And our foreign policy is strict neutrality. Britain claims neutrality, and yet Confederate gun runners have been seized on British ships. Why should we not expect the same duplicity from you? Because I stand here, and I give you my word. Do you question it? Well, what is it worth? You've already admitted that you're bound to London's will. London wills us to stay out of it. Come, sir, since we're being so frank with each other. Can you honestly expect us to get involved in your civil war? So you offer us nothing. A secure and peaceful border is not nothing. An imaginary line, mostly undefended. And by the way, the uh, Secretary of State has spoken in favor of annexing Canada outright. By force, if necessary. And of course, it would be necessary. For the last time, Canada will not meddle in American affairs. We would expect the same assurances from you. I can't give them. Gentlemen. He was in no way diplomatic. He was insulting. Unofficially, of course. Your predecessor would have been outraged. Yes, but I'm not my predecessor, Mr. Cartier. I'm not prone to outrage. Your Excellency, officially or not, we've been threatened with war. We must react. Indeed. How many men are you planning to put in arms, then? Some thousands, Your Excellency. Many thousands, of course, but the number of farmers we give muskets to is hardly going to be decisive. Are you planning to raise a proper army, then? No. 
We were under the impression that we were under the protection of the finest military in the world, Your Excellency. Oh, indeed you are. We shall uh, certainly dispatch some thousands of troops to Canada immediately. Meanwhile, the Americans will arm a million men, likely in the North alone. <laughs> Do not imagine the British Empire is going to get drawn into a land war against a force that size over an expanse of rock and trees. And how can you expect Canada to defend herself against that, Your Excellency? Well, I understand your problem, gentlemen. I regret that I cannot do more to help you solve it. before you go up yourself. Oh, aye. Anne, come meet George. <coughs> well, have you met my sister before? It's been so long. No. Mr. Premier? Oh, no, no. Just playing George Brown, please. But you were Premier. Perhaps, technically. Not in any real way. Anyway, I'm out of politics now. I'm just a businessman. Is that a difficult transition? Aye, it is. That's why I'm in Scotland. Remove myself from the temptation for a while. But you must be concerned by the war in America. Oh, very much, Jess. Slashy. It must seem very distant from here, but in Canada it's all too immediate, believe me. My real fear is that the colonies will get pulled into it. Do you have a side? Canada, I mean. The papers here tend to favour the South. Surely not. No, no, no. My sympathies lie entirely with the abolitionist cause. Another one? Anne won't keep quiet about it. I've written on the subject, you know. I do. How do you know that? Well, I did some small research when I learned that Mr. Brown was coming to stay. I found your writings both passionate and persuasive. I'm flattered. What do you mean the British won't defend us? That's ridiculous. It's reality. They'll make a show, but they won't go to war. So how are we supposed to defend ourselves? It's not 1812 anymore. We can't very well go and burn down the yes, White yes, House Yes, 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 we know that. America we can't is stop them by force than we are. of arms. Therefore, we must mount a real effort to dissuade them from invading. Meaning what, John? What's a real effort? 50,000 men in arms, a million dollars for fortifications all the way across the country from Quebec City to Sault Ste. Marie. We can't afford that, John. We can raise it. You're proposing conscription. That is how armies are raised, yes. You're not making sense, John. First you say we can't defend ourselves, then you say you have to raise an army? Why? If we can't win, why? Because there must be a price to pay, Galt. If the Americans want us, they must realize it will cost them in blood. And if England no. will no. abandon no. us, Stop. it will cost Stop. them in honor. Stop now, John. If there's no hope of why this. Why should England defend us if we won't defend ourselves? Why shouldn't America take us if the cost is free? Not conscription. I can't support it. Not ever. We have no other choice. I can't sell it. If the Americans come, they may treat your people well, George, but they won't do it in French. Sorry, John. You will not get the votes. Damned if I won't. We have to make the maximum commitment to defense possible. It is the only chance we have of controlling our own destiny. But why do you need me? I mean, uh, you're the government. Ah, the French won't back you. Is that it? Of course they won't. And you want me to play the bogeyman so that you can have conscription and lay the blame on us? No. I'll take full responsibility. You have my word. Well, I won't do it. I'll make you Premier, Sanfield. Whatever it takes. Hey, you'll make me Premier, all right. As soon as you fall. I will bring the bill to the floor, Sanfield. At least the people can see who tried to defend their country and who stood by it. All those in favor of the militia bill? You are drunk. Why would I do this, Solar? All those opposed? Government is 
defeated. You'll be back in soon enough, John. You know it. No. I'm done with that. You're just in a blue funk. You know you can't live without it. <coughs> the Americans have a million soldiers. And I cannot even convince the assembly to raise an army, believe me. I can live without it. Bring me another bottle, Liza. It just wasn't the right time, that's all. It is exactly the right time. This godforsaken stillborn place needs to stand up and do something. We must seize nationhood. It cannot birth itself. This is the moment. Crisis is upon us and we do nothing. We let it all slip away. We'll all be Americans soon. Bring me another bottle. Liza, bring me another bottle. You. Nothing. Business. <clears throat> well, you've yet to tell me about Canada. Oh. I'll keep asking until you do. Well, the usual descriptions are that it's large, empty, and bitterly cold in the winter time. But that's not true. Oh, no, I'm afraid it's all too true. There's almost no class system, but you'd probably be appalled. Probably not. The fundamental tragedy in Canada is that it is entirely misconceived, being joined. No comes rests or character. We share neither language nor religion, and yet we are lumped together in a single parliament to prevent domination of the French minority by the English majority. I see. It's understandable. If you're French, perhaps. But those of us in the majority are denied our democratic rights. Now, if we are to be forced into a single government with the French, so be it. But if we have the majority, we should have untrammeled control over it. How can you argue otherwise? Oh. What have I said? We are in Scotland here, Mr. Brown. The idea that the English majority should have untrammeled control over us is not naturally popular. I... But it's not the same. C'est sûrement comparable. You speak French. I do. And if I were French living in Canada, I wouldn't want to be dominated by you just because you're English. Uh, I'm afraid I must seem something of a tyrant. No. I... You've exposed me. I've not looked at Canada with any perspective but my own narrow one. Well, perhaps traveling has broadened your perspective. Traveling has confirmed my love for the place, I... You're what's broadened my perspective. You have been a wholly improving influence on me. And I shall miss that terribly. You're here for many months still. No, you're not. I have an admission to make. I've booked an early passage back home. I don't feel right being away with the American threat. In fact, I, I plan to fund the militia when I return. How soon? Two weeks, soonest I could get. I booked two cabins. I was going to hire a clerk, but then I realized that I, I don't need one. You could have it. I mean, you could have my cabin, and I'll take the clerks. 
if you wanted to. Isn't it? Hmm. There's no shame in it. It's a relief for everyone, really. Her more than anyone. What's a relief? What does that mean? Oh. Only that she was so sick, Hugh, and well, now she's not in any pain anymore. She didn't want to die. I'm not saying that. We all miss her, Hugh. I want to come live with you. But we want you to come live with us, Hugh. With your Aunt Louisa and all your cousins. I don't want to. Come here, Hugh. <clears throat> Have a seat. It's not really feasible, Hugh. I wish it were. Why can't I? You need to be in a proper home with other children and someone who can cook and isn't going to work 12 hours a day. But I want to live with you. All right, you, I'll tell you what. See how it goes until school ends and, and then you come for a good long visit, you. And then we'll decide what to do after that, okay? Yes, sir. George, and this must be Anne. So pleased to meet you. I hope you don't find this place too boring. No, I'm fascinated by newspapers. I read two every morning. Well, you'll only need one now, I suppose. <laughs> no, now I'll need three. Uh, George, we need to talk. Well, not about politics. I'm out of it. It's about the lead editorial. All right, what is it? We want to come out against Sandfield. Are you mad? He's your leader. George, he's a disaster. We can't just stand by. Is that really wise? Well, it is regrettable, ma'am, but necessary. He's decided that we need majorities in both halves of the province, the upper and the lower, or he withdraws the bill. Even if it's easily got enough votes to pass, he calls it the double majority principle. Double stupidity principle. I am not involved. Civil war rages in America. And the assembly chases its tail. Stupid fools. I'm far more useful raising a militia here than I would be banging my head against the wall in Quebec City. I made the right choice there. You don't want to be in Parliament? Legislative assembly. Whatever you call it, you want to go, George. It's as plain as day. Well, of course I would. If I could run things, I'd like to be able to sprout wings and fly like a bird, too. You could run things. I can't, Anne. MacDonald has made it impossible for me to go back. Is that what's keeping you away? Fear of John A. MacDonald? I'm not afraid of him. Not afraid of any of them. Anyway, it's not the men, it's the very constitution of the government. I mean, you'd think that with me and MacDonald gone, things would change. But this new lot are worse than we were. No. Canada just doesn't work, that's all. Place is broken. So how are you going to fix it? It's a serious question, George. You say the government doesn't work. Well, you're a political leader. 
You own the country's leading newspaper. What are you going to do to fix it? I don't know that it can be fixed. You'd have to start again, go back to two separate provinces, try to work out an equitable deal between them. So why don't you propose that? Dissolve the union. But why not? We break the deadlock. That will give us a way out. So are we going to Quebec City then? I'd have to get elected first. All right then. Okay. I found you. <laughs> Go away. I will not. I've come all the way from Montreal. It's not my fault you wasted your time. Be friends, John. You ready? Yeah. Oh. At least I've caught you relatively sober. Quite. I presume you've come to tell me that the government is ready to fall. <laughs> this Sandfield ministry is a disaster. I'm within a couple of votes of taking them down. You could find two votes. To what end? So we can get back in until Sandfield buys two votes back? And we fall again? I have no interest. Look at that! <laughs> Come on, John. If the government must be impotent, let it at least be us. Let it be you, George. By all means. I'm done with failing. <laughs> Time for a bottle of planet, I think. Liza. You're still the leader of the party, John. I'm sorry, George. <sighs> um, you've heard about George Brown? He's married and richer than Croesus. Bully for him. He was right to get out. There's news that he's coming back. He's asked to give the opening speech in Quebec. Apparently he's got some new plan to save the country. I'd like to begin, but... <coughs> I would like to begin by apologizing to the French members of the House. The offenses I've spoken against you are too numerous to list, but I regret them, everyone. I've stood for What's the principle doing? that this assembly apologizing represent the population of this colony, and I still do. But I've given insufficient thought to the rights and the interests of the minority peoples, and for that I am heartily sorry. Don't encourage him. But the fact remains that this assembly does no longer function. Twenty years of impasse have proven it. Reform is needed. And if rep by pop cannot be imposed upon the United Canada, then I say, let us dissolve the union. Aye, right, let us go back to what we were. Let us be Upper and Lower Canada again, and then only enter into a larger association as it benefits both of us. We must accept the fact that our union has as failed as the American one. 
We must avoid their mistakes and act before things become impossible. Before we have our own civil war. Mr. Speaker, how can we avoid the mistakes of the Americans if we repeat them? Does Mr. Brown not understand that the attempts at separations by the South led to the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of Americans. And now he pushes us to follow that example. Is he mad? I suggest no such thing. I suggest a fresh start between friends. You suggest separation, Mr. Brown. Don't deny it. Just at the time we must most band together, you would rip us apart. Mr. McDonald misunderstands me. I agree that we must, of course, avoid the American mistakes, but we are not... Americans. Oh, not yet anyway. But we're on the bloody edge of it. And you're aiming to push us over. Once again, I agree with Mr. MacDonald. We are in danger of losing our very nation, which is why we must act together as countrymen. Now, I believe my proposal is a way forward, but I do not pretend that it is the only way possible. And I stand ready to listen to anyone with another. We must reform our constitution so it works. And I propose an immediate conference on the subject where every idea will be considered without fear or favor. Who will join me? Gentlemen, I implore you. The times demand it. There can be no harm in frank discussion. For the love of God. We need to topple the government. Based on what? We all just agreed on something for once. Yes, to a sham conference run by George Brown. He's just trying to take over again. He's not trying to take over. He's trying to reform a government that doesn't work. Take off your blinders. Are you not listening? He's not going to reform us. He's going to split us in two. It's madness. We will be picked off by the Americans and eaten up one by each. Or perhaps we'll have a civil war first instead. We're nowhere near that. You're letting your feelings cloud your judgment. And what if I am? My country is dying. And I will not stand dispassionately by and watch George Brown help finish the job. I will not see him become premier. We will topple the liberals immediately. It doesn't matter who the government is. It doesn't work regardless of who's in. You've told me the same a dozen times, but now Brown says it, and suddenly you can't see the plain truth. Brown is offering an answer. You are not. Unless you find one, you will lose to him regardless of who's sitting in the government seats. First things first. All those who lack confidence in the government Thank you. The government is defeated. What now? I can buy votes just as easily as they can. I'll have them back in opposition before the month is out. Can you not look past your own nose, Sandfield? It doesn't matter who's premier. We must act as a united assembly. Fine! They can unite under me! God save us from petty men. Monsieur Carchet. Is it possible we could have a word? Of course. I'd like to discuss constitutional reform with you. Have you considered my proposal? Undoing the United Province? Aye. A French nation free of excessive meddling from without. Is it not an attractive concept to you? It's a perilous concept, Mr. Brown. And yet, I'm seriously considering it. And Mr. MacDonald, is he? Most emphatically not. He finds talk of separation to border and treason, leavened with insanity. He will not talk to you, no. Well, I can't say I expected otherwise. But is Mr. MacDonald's approval really essential? You cannot unite the assembly by driving a wedge between myself and Johnny. I'm not trying to. I'm simply calculating the math. Now, if you and I were agreed on a course of action, 
We'd need neither your leader's approval nor mine. We'd have the votes without them. But we are not agreed, Mr. Brown. We have only begun a discussion. He's willing to compromise. He's a changed man, John. I swear. Yes, his ideas have gotten worse. Stop obsessing about Brown. It's not the man you must counter. It's his idea. And his idea, George, is precisely the opposite of what we need. We don't need to shrink. We need to grow. In every way. In arms, in people, in territory. That's exactly what I've been saying. We need a grand confederation of all the British North American possessions in one great entity. A country to match Americans in size. Yes, Galt, and we have agreed it's not feasible. London will not give us control of the other colonies. Or maybe they will. What's that? Maybe they will. Oh, and why would they do that? Things have changed. London doesn't want to be exposed to war with America. They are prepared to leave the whole patchwork of British North American colonies adrift. We'd all be fragments of empire that Mother England doesn't want anymore, waiting until America swallows us up. But we're the biggest colony, right? Why not just take them? All of them. Let's bind them to us. British Columbia, Victoria, New Brunswick, Newfoundland. And it'd be harder to swallow a whole continent from America, wouldn't it? I've been saying that for years. This is the solution, George, to create a confederation large enough to provide both independence and protection for French and English alike. The Maritimes have stronger ties to Maine and Boston than they do to Montreal. Well, there is not even a single road connecting us. Why would they want to join with Canada? Because we'll convince them to. We'll seduce them, we'll bully them, whatever it takes. George, this idea is big enough to make even the Americans change course. George. George. I could support it. But it would take a united assembly to even dream of achieving it. We would need George Brown. He's right, John. That's a problem. Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Mr. Brown has boldly challenged this assembly to find a pathway to constitutional reform, and this government has risen to the call. We are developing a major new plan of action, and will present it to this assembly within a matter of days. Well, no, you won't. Mr. Speaker, I wish to present a motion of non-confidence in this government. What are you doing, Sunfield? <laughs> Nothing that wasn't done to you. Mr. Speaker, the timing of this is outrageous. The government has a vital constitutional proposal and we strongly feel the assembly should consider it before any votes of confidence are taken. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I only follow the precedent set by Mr. McDonald himself. Oh, Opportunist. No delays. I move the vote. Seconded. Gentlemen, please. Oh, but Sanfield, you're just going to force another useless election. Yeah, and we'll win please, it? we cannot dissolve the assembly at this time. We stand on the brink of solving this dilemma. Let me at least explain our proposal. I implore you. I move that the Premier be allowed to speak. Seconded. How dare you undermine me? I want to hear what the man has to say. Mr. Speaker, there is already a motion on the floor, and I demand a vote. All those who lack confidence in the government... The government is defeated. I'm on the verge of winning over the assembly to constitutional reform and you blow up the government. We will make progress and we're the government. I give you my word. Oh, we won't. The last time you were in, you couldn't even pass wind. Oh, for guts.
We need to talk. Mr. MacDonald. Oh. And Brown. You're the woman who's talked sense into our George. Pity you've no one left to do it for you. I didn't mean that the way that it came out. It's all right. Thank you for your condolences. And for the opening of George's mind, too. I won't allow you to insult my husband, Mr. MacDonald. Will you allow me to compliment yourself? Emphatically, no. I've come to accept that you're right. The Constitution must be reformed. Aye. But we're thinking in larger terms. Mr. Cartier was not entirely opposed to my suggestion when I discussed it with him. Wouldn't you like to hear ours? Please. It is our intention to seek a grand confederation of all British North American possessions. All colonies and territories alike, from Nova Scotia to Vancouver Island. Well, why don't you seek control over India, too, and Australia? Perhaps you could ask Washington to spare a couple of extra states while you're at it. Is that your considered response? We can't get the Assembly to agree with two sections, and your solution is to add more, to create a more cumbersome version of what we already have of a grand confederation of impotence. No, this is the way to achieve what you yourself propose. You suggest that Upper Canada should have its own government and also be part of something larger. The United Province of Canada isn't big enough to make that work. But all British North America is. Confederation. It's a pipe dream. I've heard you say as much yourself. Well, it's not likely we could agree on anything, you and I, is it? But if we were to... George, who knows what we could achieve? Mr. Speaker, I bring exciting news. The government is pursuing an alternative option the for... The government has been defeated. Why have they not resigned? Because it is unthinkable to throw this country into an election when there is a plausible way to avoid it. Mr. Speaker, this is unacceptable. They have been defeated. I'm afraid Mr. Sandfield is right. You must resign. There's no alternative. Yes, there is. We are currently in negotiations to form a new government. Negotiations with who? Nobody's spoken with me, Dorian. Moi non plus. Mr. Speaker, I demand the Premier support his claim or... Give it up! Really, Mr. MacDonald, this is not acceptable. We are negotiating with the member for South Oxford. We impeach this assembly to grant us a brief adjournment so that these vital discussions can continue. So moved. Seconded. How dare you negotiate with the Conservatives? I will expel you from the caucus! Are you a traitor to your party? No, sir. I am a loyalist to my country. The Assembly will consider a motion to adjourn for one day. All those in favour? The Assembly is adjourned for one day. You both know that I am not opposed to joining all the other colonies, but I cannot substitute hopes for action. You'll have action. Within a year. If we haven't shown enough progress to satisfy your doubts by then, we'll both sign on to your cause. We'll put it in writing. In return, you commit fully to pursuing confederation, meaning you do what I ask you to. One year. Are you fully committed to his scheme over mine? I named my daughter Reine Victoria, Mr. Brown. God rest her soul. My whole career, I've made no secret of my belief that my people's best protection lay within the British Empire. But my queens have abandoned me. 
both great and small. I believe this is the better path. All right. My support, one year. Not yet. That are details. So this is how our partnership starts, eh? With hidden caveats. No, Mr. Brown. We must unite the assembly. And not just agree to talk, but really join together. It must be the singular voice of Canada, not of liberals or conservatives. If we could unite the assembly, Mr. MacDonald, we would not need to reform the Constitution. Nevertheless, it must be done. There is a way. How? By having you come into Cabinet. Under me. Technically, we would be peers in a grand coalition government, of course, but the political reality is that you would capitulate to me utterly. I don't deny that is how it would be perceived. I will sacrifice my party ties for the good of the nation, but I will not throw away my good reputation to satisfy your petty vengeance, MacDonald. Why would you even ask this question of me? Because it is impossible, Mr. Brown, just as you say confederation is impossible. And you're right. As things stand, it is. So in order for me to achieve it, I must become a man capable of doing the impossible. And the best proof of that is winning my enemy, George Brown, over to my cause, and not just to my cause, but to my service. We would be co-premiers then, with the Assembly uniting behind us both. London won't listen to co-premiers. Mr. Brown. There must be one leader who can go to London as the master of Canada, the vanquisher of all his rivals, the sole voice of the people. It's the only way to make it happen. Then why not let it be me? You go home and sit in the dark, Mr. Brown, and see if you can convince yourself it could be you. George. I don't want to disturb you. You can't say no. Is that it? No, Anne. I have sold a million newspapers calling John A. Macdonald the devil and those who go over to him worse. Now I'd be one of them. I'd be finished in public life. For joining a coalition? What use are you to him if no one will follow you? No, oh, they will follow me, Anne. They'll follow me right into his arms. And they'll never follow me again. It would require enormous courage, then. <laughs> That's the way to look at it. Is it the right thing this planet has? A grand coalition government. Seek a Canada from sea to sea. I cannot deny I feel greatness in it. It is the better plan. If I could lead it, I could fully believe in it. But MacDonald asks me to believe in him, and that may be beyond my ability to do. Are you sure you cannot lead it yourself? I. Why? Because they love him.
that's the end of it then. You've made the right choice, George? I hope so. Mr. Speaker, our nation sits on the edge of extinction. And I shame myself to think of the key part I've played in the infernal divisions that have racked us and brought us here. For ten years, I've opposed the current ministers in the most hostile manner it is possible to conceive. I have proposed dividing the United Province of Canada. My opponents have instead proposed growing it through a grand confederation. Yet I've come to accept that theirs is the better answer. If we are to survive, we must pursue a greater ambition. The future is within our grasp, but we cannot do this divided. We must grasp it together, and therefore challenge every man in this assembly to set aside party loyalties and personal ambition, and to fully support my opponent's proposal. There will be those who feel I have asked the impossible of them with this challenge, but I would ask no man to do what I am not prepared to do myself. And so today, I set aside my own ambition and my pride, and I take the steps necessary to ensure the future of this great nation. has already fallen! our intention to approach the Governor General for permission to form a new government, one unlike any in our history, a true grand coalition. Together we shall seek union with our fellow British North American colonies. And just as we now bind this assembly into one united government, so shall we bind this continent into one great country. <laughs> Sacrificed in vain. 